Indeed, this is the last presentation I'm going to give as the Chief Marketing Officer of Unilever. So hopefully I don't get too nostalgic. But funnily enough, after 35 years, it's the first presentation I'm giving in front of my wife, who... <laughs> So I'm going to be a little bit more nervous than usual um, because uh, she's going to hold to me account and go back to the kids and say, do you know what? He wasn't that good. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to talk about a sort of a, a view of tomorrow. And I thought, what better way than try and pull sort of three lessons um, of, uh, of my experiences and share those uh, with you? And I thought, uh, the three lessons, why don't I take one from the past? Because if you're a good historian, you know that uh, the future is built uh, so much on the past. Uh, I'll take one from the present and then sort of one sort of going into the future uh, and share those with you. And, uh, and at the end, you can like sort of reflect on, on what, what are those that sort of really resonate with you and confirm your views. And OK, we'll do more of that. Or maybe there's something I do which uh, sort of challenges some of the things uh, that you're doing right now. And uh, then you can either agree with me or agree with yourself and say he's not quite right. Or maybe there's some new ideas uh, that I share uh, that will give you an opportunity to then think differently uh, about what you're doing. And any of those three is, is, is sort of fine uh, by me. So let's start off uh, with uh, lesson one. So lesson one for me is all about putting people first. You know, we are marketers, we're advertisers, and putting people first is something I've learned over and over again. And it's understanding, of course, that marketing is all about people. It's about real people, with real lives. And that is say, you know, not consumers, you know, not a, a pair of armpits in search of a deodorant or a head of hair uh, looking for a shampoo. We're talking about real people and real lives. And I think sort of you know, understanding people and understanding their lives is a great role marketers can do, not just for their brands, but for their businesses. It's spotting trends. It's bringing the outside in. It's bringing the future forward. And this ever-changing and challenging world, I don't think there can be anything more important for businesses and brands than having a point of view of what's going on in the future. And what it also means is getting out into the world, each and every one of us, as advertisers and marketers, to understand about what is going on. What do people want? What do they care about? What do they need, and how can we serve them better? And that does mean spending real time with real people. Now you're thinking, hold on. Here we are as advertisers and marketers, and we're talking about we need to engage with people. We know that. And it is common sense. But I think one of the big challenges of marketing today is with all the complexity of being a marketer, is you have the challenges of meetings and emails, you have the challenges of the whole new complexity turbocharged by technology. And so often I find what happens is the one thing that gets sacrificed is time with consumers and really understanding consumers. And if you're honest to yourself, and don't worry, I'm not going to do a Stefan, put your hands up, but if you're honest with yourself, look at the last month. How much time did you spend in meetings? How much time did you spend sending emails? And how much time did you spend with consumers understanding what they want, and understanding their lives. Now, I do a, sort of, a lot of uh, country visits around the world. Uh, in fact, uh, your president, uh, Antonio Casanova, who runs our business here in Unilever, I was with him a couple of days ago, uh, and his team uh, talking about um, very similar things that I'm going to talk about today. However, what I normally do, I didn't do this time because it's four weeks and it's no more in this job. What I normally do is I spend the first day uh, with consumers and with the trade. And I go out and I speak to consumers, whether I'm in Brazil or, or Mexico or Thailand or Indonesia uh, or indeed Russia or Africa. Go out and spend some time with, with consumers. Go out, see the trade, see what's going on, and then join uh, our management team. And on one com company, and I won't say which one, uh, but on one I turned up and there was our, our, our CEO of, of the country, uh, surrounded by his leadership team, the board, and he said, well, I hope you had a good time. Now the real work begins. And I said, woo, what do you mean the real work begins? And what he meant was, well, now we're going to do sort of um, slides with P&Ls and business and talk. 
And I said, well, that's interesting, the signal you've just given to your leadership team, that seeing consumers and seeing the trade is not real work. And when she said, oh, no, no, I was just joking. I said, well, were you joking? You've got to be really careful. You are the leader of this organization. I made him suffer a little bit. You're the leader of the organization in front of your leadership team, and you have just signaled to all of them that actually spending time with consumers and spending time out in the trade, understanding our retailers, is not real work. And I think as leaders and everyone here in this room, we need to think about this, because how we act and our shadow communicates a huge amount to our teams. And if we don't take this seriously, I guarantee you the rest of our teams aren't taking it seriously as well. So I want to use an example. I said this is one from the past. Um, I used to run our home care business and our laundry business globally. And it's extraordinary because you know, Unilever started um, as a soap and laundry business. But this business was uh, very challenged back in 2005. It got a little bit lost. In fact, our laundry business was declining and our household uh, care business was declining as well. And when I joined the business uh, in running it globally, I suddenly realized that what everyone was doing, because we were under pressure, is we were optimizing the business. There was lots of talk about you know, um, where we're going to put the capex and what we need to do here and the various parts on the P&L. And we were optimizing our business versus serving consumers. And serving consumers, of course, if you do that better than the alternative, you win through uh, every single time. So I set off with my leadership team then and said, you know what we're going to do? Is we are going to uh, rediscover what people are doing around the world in a way that we haven't done for a long time and get up close and personal uh, with consumers and, of course, understand our business around the world. But what we're also going to do is really understand uh, what our consumers are using, how they're using, and what they would prefer to do. So, yes, up close and personal. Um, here I am in a, in a Mumbai slum. You can imagine the shock of this poor lady, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, A, seeing a man uh, on, on the floor um, cleaning clothes, but then this strange Western guy as well, uh, cleaning uh, her husband's underwear, uh, made her feel a little bit uneasy. But the point being is, wherever we were, we got up close and personal. We also um, went from country to country, and um, you know, around the world, um, we went and understood uh, how our products would be used, what alternatives would be used. You know, you can only spend your minute once, so I think you need to spend it wisely. And we spent a lot of minutes, uh, not just going through market research, which of course we did, but understanding our, our consumers, our products, and their lives. And I have to say, five years later, in 2010, um, this was our fastest growing division. Our household care and laundry was our fastest growing division. We turned the business around. And not only that, to this day, nine years later, it's still our fastest growing uh, division. So the story that I want to pull out of this first lesson is actually if you really put people first, it's the best way of getting a growing business to grow faster or getting a failing business to turn around. And of course, then I then moved into this job uh, nine years ago to be the chief marketing officer uh, of Unilever. Now, my second lesson is more of today. That was one from the past, but of course, takes through to today. My second one is, is uh, of today, and that's about being purpose-led. Now, I'm sure there's quite a few inward rolls of eyes. Oh, my God, he's going to talk about purpose. Haven't we talked enough about purpose in this industry? Every conference I go to, someone gets up and talks about purpose. And I would argue we're only scratching the surface of purpose right now. We're only scratching the surface. The world is very challenged, and we have another 2 billion people joining this planet. And the role of brands in serving people and helping society and the environment uh, is significant, and it's going to get more significant as we go forward. And it's got to be both brand say and brand do. If it's just brand say, that is, that's, green, that's greenwashing. And I think what we have to think about is, no, they've got to do something as well. So yes, if you took Dove as example, you know, Dove is challenging the, the uh, beauty industry, uh, talking about real beauty, uh, and Dove in its position in the way that it shows um, uh, uh, the importance of building self-esteem. But on the other side, it is the largest educator of self-esteem in the world. We've already taught 35 million uh, young women about the beauty industry and debunking uh, the myths. So we need to do the say, but you need to do the do as well. And if you do say and do, uh, as people demand more from brands, uh, we will win through. Because the world is full of some fantastically large problems and significant challenges. 
But this was ever thus. If I took you back to the late 1800s, Lord Leverhulme, starting Unilever, he looked around at the dirt and squalor of Victorian England, and he thought, you know, I want to, I want to help these people. And this is before you had McKinsey and EY telling you about purpose statements, etc. He came up with a purpose statement in the late 1800s that he wanted to make cleanliness commonplace. Cleanliness commonplace. And what he basically wanted to do was take soap to the masses. And indeed, he succeeded because uh, we are still the largest soap company in the world. And he took soap around the world, helping people on a day-to-day -day basis be, be cleaner. And I think we, as an industry, need to take on the challenges we see around us right now. So whether this be about water scarcity um, and products like sunlight that we do, or whether this be, as I say, Dove and debunking the, the myths uh, around the beauty industry, or whether it be actually just listening to consumers. And this is uh, Ben and Jerry uh, scraping across the social network about people striving um, for um, vegan ice cream and looking for vegan ice cream. Uh, and indeed, if you haven't tasted Ben and Jerry's vegan ice cream, this is the recommendation you will never regret. Um, it tastes absolutely fabulous, uh, serves uh, the purpose of vegan ice cream, uh, but it has you all enjoyment of an ice cream as well. Because I believe that only brands with a clear vision uh, to actually have a positive impact on the world will survive. And if you want to build a big brand in the future, this is going to get more and more important. And that's why back in 2010, as I moved into the CMO role, um, I also run sustainability. So I run social and environmental sustainability for Unilever as well. And we launched the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, a plan with 50 time-based targets, uh, really challenging things like we'll source all our agricultural raw materials sustainably by 2020. We're the largest tea company in the world, we're the largest ice cream company in the world. That's a significant challenge. But interesting, what we've also shown with our sustainable living brands, and these are brands that have purpose and also deliver against the USLP, they grew 46% faster than the rest of our business, and they delivered 70% of our growth. So you can see now the, the, the business case for what we're doing is coming through uh, very clearly. So let me take them to lesson three, and lesson three is now looking more into the future. And this is about understanding trust. It's true now, it's going to get even more true as we go forward. Now, Jeff Bezos has this great uh, uh, line where he says that people always ask me, you know, what's going to change in the next 10 years? Hey, that is interesting. You know, and I'm sure Jeff Bezos has a real insight about what might change. But he says what people don't ask him is what's not going to change. And actually, What's going to change means you have to build agility and make sure you can switch because you don't really know what's going to change. But if you can work out is what's not going to change and what's going to remain the same, you can build a business strategy. And one thing that's not going to change in our industry is the importance of trust. Because at the end of the day, a brand without trust is just a product. And advertising without trust is just noise. And the trouble is for all of us here is people are trusting advertising less. They don't trust advertising as much as they used to. And the worst thing is, is it's a year after year decline. You can plot it. It's not up and down. No, it's year after year decline. The good news is, is we haven't got to the tipping point yet, and we can, we can resolve this. We can turn this around. But we have to start acting now. So back in January, I dug into this a little bit deeper and try to understand what are all these things that are undermining trust in our industry. So I'm going to share rapidly with you uh, what I call then the uh, seven deadly sins. And of course, sin number one is one that we know well, um, is actually the quality of advertising itself. As advertising quality drops, surprise, surprise, people trust advertising less. And the Brits, who are famed for loving advertising, 20 years ago, loved advertising as much as the programming, and now, half of them say TV advertising is annoying. I pull the TV, TV stat to make the point is that I'm not just talking about digital, I'm talking about the whole of advertising right now. But quality of, of advertising is one. Of course, the other one that undermines trust is about fake accounts and fake followers and fake engagement, and we all know that well. The third one is about data. Hey, we know that one as well, don't we? It's people having concerns about data. 73% of people across Europe have concerns 
uh, about data and their data privacy. Fourth one, uh, again, you heard this mentioned uh, a little bit earlier uh, by Stefan, is about advertising turning up in the wrong place and being so seen to fund um, bad activity. Fifth one, fake news. Fake news is a huge underminer. It was the Collins Dictionary uh, Word of the Year recently, uh, and the amount of search going on about people trying to understand about fake news is going up. And then this one's a curious one, personalization, because, hey, wasn't this the thing that was going to meant, meant to be great about digital advertising, is we were going to crack this one. And I honestly believe we will. I think personalization is going to be a huge opportunity uh, for the industry. But the challenge we have right now is we're doing it badly. And in doing it badly, uh, we are undermining trust. And last but not least is just good old bombardment. So we now have another three hours of media time a day, thanks to the mobile phone. That's, of course, when you're commuting. Uh, and indeed, when you are um, uh, going in between places, you can go on the mobile phone, and that's more media time. And of course, there's office time. Um, as uh, we were chatting um, uh, with Antonio in, um, in the office earlier uh, this week, you couldn't, five years ago, go into the office and put a television on your desk and start watching television. Your boss would notice that. But indeed, you can pull out your mobile and have a quick look at Facebook or buy something on Amazon. And of course, that's increased people's media time. But in that, we're bombarding people, apparently about 10,000 messages a day. Now, you don't see 10,000 messages a day because you're brilliant at screening it out. And then you're brilliant at screening it out, which is, of course, a big challenge to us in the ad industry because we need to get through that. So bombardment's another area we need to address. And now I'd just like to little, go a little bit further and focus on online advertising. And the reason why is at the end of the day, uh, this is the area that has least trust, and this is the area which is growing the fastest. We're moving more advertising into online, and that has some of the biggest challenges right now. Now, of course, this is an area I've talked about a lot um, over the years, about cleaning up the digital uh, ecosystem. Um, I first of all started talking about the three V's of viewability, verification, uh, and value, and very much focused on uh, the industry issues. But as Stefan said, something happened about a year ago. A tipping point happened because this became a societal issue. It's no longer an industry issue. It's a societal issue, and as the advertisers who fund uh, this activity, we need to take our own responsibilities. So February last year, um, Unilever launched the Responsibility Framework, um, and this is uh, out to the uh, digital platforms, and we first of all said that we will prioritize working with responsible platforms, platforms who weren't divisive, platforms who supported children, um, and indeed, um, in mid-year, in June, we extended that with a focus on influencers and influencer marketing, and uh, saying that we would uh, only work with influencers who didn't buy followers, and again, prioritize the platforms uh, who supported cleaning this up. And I'm pleased to say, that was June, I'm pleased to say now, um, just over six months later, 1.6 billion fake accounts have been removed off the three platforms of Twitter, uh, YouTube, and Instagram. So big action's been taken. And I think in probably in about another six months, we'll be in a very different place for influencer marketing, and we are collectively uh, cleaning up uh, that area. Our second area of focus was about responsible content. And I'm really pleased that Stefan called out the Unstereotype Alliance um, and, and also um, the, the big drive um, about CEHA as well to get uh, diversity um, stereotypes out of advertising. Gender diversity to start with, but all stereotypes uh, ultimately. And collectively, um, if you don't know about it, please look it up. Uh, run by UN Women, hashtag Unstereotype. But it's a significant initiative with all uh, big advertisers, all the holding companies are part of this, Google, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Unilever, P&G, WFA, ANA. Um, but if we can get behind uh, these uh, various initiatives, we can make a major impact uh, on the uh, marketplace. And the last one was about infrastructure. And again, Stefan called out something there about cross-media measurement. One of the problems about bombardment is we overserve some people and we underserve others. And we're over-serving you and underserving you because we can't see across the whole of media and optimize media. So if we can find a way of optimizing media across the whole platforms, uh, then of course we can uh, may, uh, make a much better uh, proposition to consumers. And we've been working Unilever uh, with Google and Facebook and Twitter and Nielsen and Kantar for an extended period of time in coming up with a potential approach for cross-media measurement. 
And we've made some really good progress, so much so uh, we then turned to the WFA um, and uh, we said, actually, we want to make this uh, industry sourced. This will only work if the whole industry um, comes together. And as an industry source, um, it would be uh, a real impact and we can get cross-media measurement to work. So the WFA, here's another ad for the WFA. Sign up, you know the man, Stefan, um, and, uh, and get part uh, of the cross-media measurement initiative, which will help the industry, but most importantly, it will help consumers not being over and underserved. And today is the next phase of our responsibility um, work. Uh, and I'm announcing today, and you'll see it in the press, the Unilever Trusted Publishers. And the Unilever Trusted Publishers is a way of making sure that we can champion the good actors and put a spotlight on the bad and diminish the bad. And I said earlier, the viewability, verification, and value has been well used uh, by Unilever in evaluating where we spend our money. 100% viewability, third-party verification. And what we're doing is we're extending it with these and more around um, ad experience and formats and ad fraud and brand safety and data access and traffic quality to ensure that we can get to uh, a group of trusted uh, publishers. And in doing that, we'll get greater transparency, more effective use of time and money, and better online experience. Better online experience. It comes back again, serving our consumers better. And if we do that, it's been clear for many years now, transparency, more effective use of time and money, and better online experiences will unlock this market. And I believe the Unilever Trusted uh, Publishers, as our next phase in the whole responsibility framework, uh, will be uh, the next step to get us closer to closer to where I believe we all want to be, and that is a better experience for all on the internet. So that brings me to the conclusion of my three lessons, really, the things that I've learned. Uh, firstly, put people first. Secondly, be purpose-led. And thirdly, build trust. But they all have one thing in common. It's learning the same lesson over and over again. And it's the importance of people. We, as an industry, will thrive if we serve people better. And if we serve people better, we can define our future. And I guarantee you it's going to be exciting and it's very much eagle for the future of the marketing industry. Thank you.